Hello again, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. Up first, up uh, hazardous weather graphic. Uh, no watches or warnings out, but there are some uh, advisories here. There we go. Uh, yellow shaded areas start here, Susitna Valley zone, north of Talkeetna. Winter weather advisory until 6 p.m., so just a couple more hours. Uh, of that going on. Um, rain south of Talkeetna or from e even in Talkeetna with uh, southerly wind still gusting as high as 35 miles an hour around Willow uh, this afternoon where they picked up about uh, I think it was four tenths of an inch of rainfall in the last 12 hours. And for the eastern Alaska range winter weather advisory out uh, through Monday night so a while to go with this one yet for Occasionally gust winds, gusty winds and creating blowing snow, reducing visibilities. Uh, and again, that's out until Monday night when weather advisory here, <coughs> excuse me, for the uh, Yukon Flats, that's out until midnight tonight for uh, snow, areas of blowing snow and uh, uh, maybe an inch or two additional accumulation, but that'll uh, reduce visibilities wherever there's any wind blowing. Same thing going on up here over the uh, Eastern Brooks Range zone, north, actually that's the Eastern North Slope area there into the Brooks Range uh, on the north side there. But uh, that's out uh, until 6 a.m. Monday. So for tonight, for the same sort of conditions, lowered visibilities due to blowing snow, gusty winds, and not, uh, nothing heavy additional, maybe a couple more inches. Also that's going on here on the Western Arctic coast. And winter weather advisory tonight also for the Seward Peninsula, looks like Kotzebue and Selwick Valley areas, Buckland on up into the Noatak Valley along the northwest coast. And that uh, is for tonight, may end actually sooner. With uh, looking at satellite imagery, you can see the uh, system that came up across the Alaska Peninsula Friday night and brought the strong winds and warmer temperatures and kind of a very changeable weather pattern yesterday to southern Alaska, also into the interior. That's continued to move northward and weakening. Here you can see the uh, moisture pushing north-northeastward uh, to the east of the low center and the southerly and southwesterly winds circulation right out here. Cold air coming down behind that. You can see pouring out of the Russian far east there, uh, surging down again. And uh, also here, the next storm coming northward there, kind of colliding with this colder air. But that's uh, kicking the winds up, uh, pretty good winds and snow going on at Shimia. And I'll continue to increase tonight and that whole pattern will shift eastward here. Uh, this uh, cold air mass coming down is going to block it from really pushing due north and it's going to take a more of an easterly direction. Otherwise, we've got some uh, southerly flow, mild uh, pattern here coming up, uh, maybe a few showers, Kodiak Island is colliding us here, streaming up uh, onto the North Gulf Coast, kind of ahead of a Arctic front here that's back to the west with upper level low pushing off to the east. And we've got, uh, oh, about four tenths of an inch or up to uh, half an inch of precipitation fell today at the, uh, or four tenths of an inch in Valdez, as I mentioned, and uh, Willow had, well, Valdez, Willow I mentioned, had about half an inch of rain. Valdez had four tenths of an inch of rain minus the wind. It was windier in uh, Willow today. And uh, kind of a breezy day across Copper River Basin with some light amounts there. Everywhere down along the southeast coast had uh, clouds, areas of rain. Huna had about uh, half an inch as well. Otherwise, most of the other locations I looked at had a tenth of an inch or less there. So nothing too terribly heavy going on with that moisture. Just kind of a weak trough moving on through there with some areas of light rain showers north Gulf Coast, uh, tapering off here along the uh, Seward Peninsula area. But that moisture extending, a few isolated showers around Kodiak Island today. And then mixed precipitation, 
again uh, on up to the Alaska Range. North side though, areas of snow. Indian Mountain picking up a few inches of snow, as did Nanana today. Also had anywhere from one to three, maybe four inches there. And some areas didn't get any at all. Kind of a dry afternoon here, uh, high pressure at the surface building into the southwest interior areas, but still a lot of clouds around, although it looks like it's breaking out there around Togiak and Dillingham, some snow showers out over the Bering Sea, around the Pribilofs there as that uh, colder air comes in. Once again, snowfall levels back down to sea level. Areas of snow with this uh, weakening system there tracking up now above 1,000 millibars on the surface pressure. But areas of snow up there along the western Arctic coast, again, Seward Peninsula, no one weather advisory out for tonight. And here's the uh, next uh, storm system, gale and storm force winds associated with that ahead of the occluded front there. Also uh, gradually warming temperatures, so look for the uh, snow to change over to uh, mixture uh, toward rain later tonight. And that will be pushing eastward tonight. Look for uh, wind and precipitation increase for Adak and Atka. Probably come up to gale force winds there. But high pressure here over the eastern Aleutians, Bristol Bay actually north, another center there over the Yukon Delta, links up with the Arctic High over the Russian Far East and the weaker center here over the central interior areas. Either side of that center, areas of snow, light snow, snow showers there from the Alaska Range, maybe in the northern Cusquam Valley, up across the uh, Tanana Valley, greater Fairbanks area, Nanana Fairbanks on up uh, across the White Mountains, or maybe to Eagle, and then a few flurries on the eastern Arctic coast, a trough, really that low weakening now considerably, just a trough now tonight, keeping a chance of slight snow up over the northwest. And then we have a developing system tracking northeastward here. Uh, not too strong, 1,015 millibars for that low center, but it is uh, starting to develop. And the warm front moisture with that uh, will continue to come northward and then take a turn off to the east, uh, maybe some rain and snow light amounts for the eastern North Gulf Coast, and possible snow or snow mixed with rain, depending on elevation here, coming into the Prince William Sound area, and then snow showers, Susitna Valley, probably none in Cook Inlet, or the Kenai Peninsula, tending to clear out down toward Kachemak Bay, Iliamna, but uh, rain here over the northern Panhandle, mostly dry down toward Prince of Wales Island, over toward uh, Annette. And then for tomorrow, that low center uh, strengthens, and there'll be some gusty winds and rain, possibly moderate to heavy at times ahead of this front, central and southern, southeast coast, maybe a mix to the north, but nothing serious. Most of the snow will be ahead of the warm front up in Canada. Some of that snow, though, will back to the west a little bit, and that's going to keep uh, the areas of light snow and the lower flying conditions in over the eastern uh, Copper River Basin and uh, Mentasta Pass, for example, on up into possibly Northway and Toke. High pressure building here, continuing to strengthen over western Alaska. Colder temperatures once again coming in. Northerly winds, pretty gusty in the forecast tomorrow. Anywhere from maybe 20 to as high as 45, possibly 50 miles an hour in the windier pass areas of the uh, higher terrain here. Be pretty breezy, but diminishing for Kodiak Island, gradually diminishing in the afternoon as the ridge axis shifts eastward a little bit. A couple of weak troughs here with an upper level low. Light snow, possibly uh, Eastern Brooks Range, Yukon Flats, and the Western Central Arctic Coast. Uh, nothing heavy expected at all. This front uh, edging rain in toward Nikolsky during the afternoon, and the strongest winds will be up here over the Northwest Bering Sea. And then on Monday, that whole thing elongates eastward here. High pressure controls just about all of interior Alaska. There, very weak trough still skirting the Eastern Beaufort Sea coast with a few skiffs of uh, light snow, fog, uh, maybe some gusty winds. Winds might be more of a factor with that. Uh, could see gusts 35, maybe 40 miles an hour with that and that type of pattern here. Uh, for the east, eastern Beaufort Sea coast there, more than uh, be more significant than any light snow you'd get. And rain, trying to push up the southern Kodiak Islands, say the Trinity Islands, clouds to the north, sunshine. Southern Alaska, kind of breezy here with uh, something of a gradient. Uh, Northeast winds, uh, 15, 25 miles an hour, and uh, rain mixed with snow for the Pribilofs, trending toward rain. Rain for the Alaska Peninsula and breezy conditions. Unsettled for the Aleutians behind the front and a mostly sunny day there for the southeast coast. Lows tonight, uh, pretty mild in the 30s to near 40 for overnight lows over the pan. And all lower 30s, Yakutat and Cordova, and down into the teens, colder air coming in again behind that uh, uh, boundary that's pushing eastward here into south central Alaska, below zero west of the Alaska Range and north of the Alaska Range. 
falling back into the single number, down towards zero for Northway and Toke. So quite a change from your 40 degree temperature this afternoon, well below zero eastern Beaufort Sea coast. Highs tomorrow below zero central interior all the way out to the Arctic coast in the 20s. Susitna Valley, Manuska Valley down to the Kenai Peninsula and near 40 for the eastern North Gulf Coast in the 40s for the Panhandle. Some areas only upper 30s, upper 30s for the Aleutians. And then the lows the following morning, 35 to 45 below again and 25 to 40 below, say, for the uh, Tanana Valley. Susitna Valley back a little below zero. Copper River Basin definitely below zero and near zero for Cook Inlet and the Kenai Peninsula. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving on to flying weather here, the front advancing into the Bering Sea or eastward here. Uh, IFR spreads into Adak and Athka tomorrow. Marginal VFR late in the afternoon makes its way just about to the Purple Offs with uh, improving to VFR behind the system and VFR out in advance all the way across eastern Bering Sea, St. Lawrence Island, in across the southern interior here. And then this slowly dissipating area, marginal VFR over the east side, IFR, uh, Coast Range, Wrangell Mountains, eastern North Gulf Coast, on down the Panhandle, IFR, and some IFR up here along the southern slopes of the uh, central western Brooks Range, the Long Mountains. And for the afternoon, uh, that sort of hangs tough up in that area there, with some marginal VFR down across the Yukon River Valley right about there, VFR to the northeast, VFR from the north slope on out to the Arctic coast, and uh, still some IFR hanging on the far eastern Alaska range here with marginal VFR, eastern Copper River Basin down to Cape Yakutaga, IFR for the Panhandle, VFR Kodiak, south central Alaska, most of Tanah Valley, and back to the west, across the northern Bering Sea, Seward Peninsula, Yukon Delta, Norton Sound, all VFR. Nunavak Island, start seeing some increasing clouds, marginal VFR right to the coastline late in the day, marginal for the Alaska Peninsula, IFR pushing eastward here to across on Alaska Island. And for the day on Tuesday, that uh, whole area widens here, IFR, it doesn't make much more eastward progress here, but it does push northward to St. Lawrence Island on the south coast, and uh, marginal VFR along the Yukon Delta coast, uh, VFR here, pretty good over much of interior Alaska. A little bit of marginal stuff here up to the northeast. IFR holding over the panhandle. And for the afternoon, that gives way. VFR takes over the central and northern areas there. IFR hanging uh, pretty well solid over the southern southeast coast. VFR, all of interior Alaska, Kodiak, North Gulf Coast, Prince William Sound, all the way up to the Arctic coast and a little even into the Arctic Ocean there. And uh, VFR right along the southwest coast as well. IFR now uh, staying put. Western Alaska Peninsula on Alaska Island. VFR in Nikolsky on out to Atka. Marginal Adak to Shimia where it becomes, uh, let's see, Shimia, IFR, Atu Island. Call it marginal. And for passes tomorrow, Anatuvik, marginal VFR at times. Same thing for at same forecast for Atigan, occasionally marginal. And Lake Clark and Merrill, VFR. Rainy VFR. Windy uh, starting out marginal and becoming VFR. That'll be during the morning hours. And for Isabel, starting out IFR becoming VFR. And that'll be into the afternoon with the VFR. And for uh, Mintesta, though, I think it'll stay in the IFR zone throughout much of the day. That moisture just not moving fast enough out of the area. Tanita, marginal becomes VFR pretty early. Could be VFR the entire day. And for Portage, VFR the entire day. Chilkoot and White, IFR from sunrise to sunset. And for the freezing levels here, surface uh, just north of White Pass there with a pretty good gradient here across the pan, or right along the, off the coast, two to 8,000 feet. And then at the surface, pushing back to the north here, almost to the Pribilof Islands. Icing, areas of uh, rime icing here with that uh, band of moisture ahead of that system pushing eastward. In toward the Pribilofs late, possibly eastern Aleutians from Adak and Atka, nothing over the interior, some lingering possible light rime icing or mixed here over the, along the east side here. Heavier stuff though with the main uh, batch of moisture in across the central and northern pan and look for a considerable moderate of, of about 5,000 feet. Jet stream, upper trough here, Southwest flow 120 knots, pushing the uh, moisture we just saw into the panhandle there, the trough off the coast, and cold upper low sort of tracking eastward there. 
and then ridging here along the west coast ahead of the big storm with the front in the central Aleutians. And for 9,000 feet, uh, 30 to 45 knots with this system here across all of the southeast coast there, lighter over the interior, but still westerly is about 30 knots here over the uh, northern interior. Northwest 40 Kodiak back in toward the western Alaska range and 35 central Aleutians kick up to 55 knots over the western areas. Not 3,000 feet, same pattern out here with that storm. Strongest winds out toward the center, lighter under the ridge axis. Not too bad over the eastern northern interior, but up to 30 knots with the panhandle. Turbulence, occasional moderate chop, southeast coast. And mechanical turbulence here for uh, south central Alaska Cook Inlet. Moderate chop out over the Aleutians and the Bering Sea. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens uh, from the GINA, or Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thanks for joining us again, Eric. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, we are talking about satellites today and uh, what, what are satellites? And the easy way to talk about that would be to uh, introduce our friend the globe here, which is a round uh, spheroid type shape. We haven't been on a flat earth uh, as far as uh, history is known for uh, several hundred years now. And because of that, we, we also know that we are orbiting around other objects in space and that objects are orbiting mm -hmm. around the earth as well. We call all those things satellites in some form or fashion, right Eric? Right, well this leads to the discussion of Johannes Kepler's oh, yeah. research 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, did some of the early work and founded the three laws of planetary motion, okay. which are important to planets mm -hmm. and also to weather satellites. Okay. Kepler's first law talks about how uh, the orbit of an object around another object is mm -hmm. uh, an ellipse, not necessarily a circle. Kind of a flattened circle? Yeah, okay. depending on how I mean, flat it, it could be. Okay. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just say they're mostly circular. Okay. The second law is most important for us, though, yeah. and that is the closer an object is to the thing it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. So in the solar system, the planet Mercury is mm -hmm. the closest planet to the sun. It orbits the sun in 88 days. It moves at 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's it a lot is different just than Earth. moving. Okay. Right. And um, further out from the Earth is Jupiter, mm -hmm. and it moves at only one quarter the speed of Mercury, and it has to uh, go further. So it takes 12 of our years for Jupiter to make one lap. Hmm. Okay. The further out you are, the slower you go. Okay. So we're talking about planets. Why? What does it have to do with weather satellites? Turns out, Kepler's laws apply to planets orbiting the sun. They also apply to satellites orbiting the Earth. Okay. You know, our natural satellite is the moon. There's right. the famous Apollo 8 Earthrise shot. Beautiful shot. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you could just talk about that forever. <laughs> uh, December 1968, uh -huh. the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. Okay. It takes a month to go around mm -hmm. the Earth. It's that far out, it takes a full month to do an orbit. Another shot here of the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Instead of being 250,000 miles out, the ISS is only 250 miles out. It's really close. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't take a full month for the space station to go around the Earth. It only takes right. 90 minutes. Oh. It's so close, it just whips right around 90 minutes. Okay. So weather satellites, there are a number of weather satellites and there are a number of orbits. The further out you have the satellite, the mm -hmm. longer it takes to go around the Earth. And this is important because different satellites have different purposes. So we have a satellite here. This little okay. salt shaker lid will serve as our satellite going around the Earth. Let's say you have a satellite that's 22,000 miles above the Earth. Uh -huh. This is kind of a magical spot because at that distance, it takes a full day for the satellite to go around the Earth. Oh, Imagine okay. if you put your satellite 22,000 miles up from the equator uh -huh. and had it go with the Earth as the Earth spun. At the same speed. Right. Okay. The satellite goes around the Earth just as fast as the Earth itself is turning in effect. The satellite will hover in one spot, oh, I see. and it, it appears when you make a movie loop of picture after mm -hmm. picture after picture, you can replay that and you get these movie loops. Geostationary satellites, these okay. are called, because uh -huh. they're stationary in appearance, and uh, they provide a constant frame of reference. We've got an example here. Another nice thing about these satellites, since they're that far out mm -hmm. at 22,000 miles, you can see from pole to pole, which is nice. So they're, they're pretty broad view and a constant frame of reference. So th those are the pictures, that if you're watching a weather satellite loop on TV, your favorite weather mm -hmm. show, that's the picture that you're going to see is one you that's bet. sitting over the same spot. If you're seeing a, a movie loop play uh -huh. again and again, that came from geostationary satellites. Okay. That's the only way you can do that. Yeah. The bummer, though, for us in Alaska is yeah. we're up on the very top of the planet, and mm -hmm. for, for geostationary satellites to work, they have to be over the equator. So for the geostationary bird to view Alaska, it's kind of like reading a book, but you're reading it ad john oh, like that. Right. 
So there's another kind of orbit called the polar orbit. Okay. Which is nice. We're near the pole. Yeah. And here's a satellite. Those polar orbiters are much closer to the Earth, mm -hmm. getting down toward International Space Station elevation. And they're not in the equatorial plane. Rather, their orbital plane is inclined okay. like this. And the Earth turns under that satellite as the satellite orbits. Hmm. The nice thing about that is for Alaska, the satellite will go right over Alaska a few times a day. And so you get a much closer image. We've got a, a shot from the uh, Sumi NPP satellite. Uh -huh. Uh, specifically, it's a true color image from the VIRS sensor. That's an acronym there. Okay. But it's a beautiful shot of Alaska, and you can see so much detail. The kind of detail, because you're close in. Very high resolution. You couldn't yeah. get this kind of view from geostationary satellites. Okay. The, the advantage of these polar orbiters is nice, close imagery. You can mm -hmm. see a lot of detail. The disadvantage, though, is that the satellite flies by, right. and then you have to wait a while to get the next image. And it, if geostationary weaknesses are that you're reading the page like that, mm -hmm. the polar orbiter, you're reading the page straight on, but it's, it's so close. <laughs> and then right. it zips by, okay. and you have to wait for the satellite to come around the Earth again. So there's no one perfect solution. Okay. Different satellites for different orbits. Uh, each has their strength. And amazingly, it all comes back to Johannes Kepler and his laws of planetary motion, the same laws that govern how the planets orbit the sun, they govern how the satellites orbit the Earth, and even our little pretend salt shaker right, right here. Right, okay. Well, since, uh, what, the 1957 Sputnik, we've been uh, putting man-made objects into uh, orbit around the Earth and starting to get pictures back. Who knows what mm -hmm. will happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Oh, Amazing it's, it's stuff. It's a growing science, and uh, the future is bright. Thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. And uh, for more information on GINA, and uh, what the satellite uh, systems do there and uh, what Eric's been talking about today, you can go to the web address on your screen. For Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Today's sea ice analysis, uh, Cook Inlet, uh, with the winds, warmer temperatures, really saw uh, pushed back in the sea ice. It's uh, retreated back to the north about 20 nautical miles from what it was yesterday. And out here in the Bering Sea, kind of uh, things slowing down in that southward push, uh, maybe a tad closer to the Perbloffs than it was yesterday, but not a lot of difference. And it's still expect maybe some southerly winds to get in up toward the ice, especially through this area. But the longer term now, uh, different from yesterday, it doesn't look like those southerly winds are going to get up and push it back. Um, here this upcoming week like it looked like it was. Looks like uh, storm systems staying farther to the south and that's going to keep it in east-northeast flow here over the Bering Sea for the upcoming week uh, after the next couple of days. And for the coastal water forecast, gale warnings for the southeast coast on the outer coastline. Southerly's 35 knots, seas 15 to 16 feet. Small craft advisories, central southern inside waters out of the southeast to 25 in the case of Stevens Passage, looking at gusts, almost a storm force, but not quite, 45 knots. And uh, minimum gales out of the south sustained for Lynn Canal, 7-foot seas. It'll swing around to the north on Tuesday with 4-foot seas. Light winds for Stevens Passage, variable to north at 10 with slight seas. West 15, Clarence Strait, west-northwest 20 knots for the south coast of the Panel, 13 to 14-foot seas. And uh, east, or, yeah, as you head north, you go westerly and then go easterly as you get farther north there at 20 knots with 12-foot uh, seas. Cook Inlet, north of the Forelands, light winds out of the north tomorrow at 10. Small craft advisory, southern Cook Inlet, west 25 knots, west 40 knots. They're coming out of uh, Kachemak Bay, or uh, Kamishak Bay. Kachemak Bay has lost all their sea ice now. Forgot to mention that, but uh, so anyway, those gales will be south there, although you'll catch some of that wind, and then northwest 40 for the Barren Islands dropping off to 35 knots for the western North Gulf Coast. Small craft advisories for the eastern Co North Gulf Coast, Middleton Island Zone, and Prince William Sound, both at uh, 30 knots, forecast of 30 knots from the northwest with six to eight foot seas. And for Tuesday, Prince William Sound, north winds 15, northeast 15, Middleton Island area, northeast 20 for the western North Gulf Coast, northeast 20 for the western North Gulf Coast. Northwest 20 for the Barren Islands and Southern Cook Inlet, Kamishak Bay, Northerlies 30 knots with uh, 8 to 9 foot seas. Winds stay light for Northern Cook Inlet out of the Northeast. And for Bristol Bay, light Northerlies tomorrow at 10 and uh, 15 knot winds for the Alaska Peninsula. On the uh, Pacific side, Northwest at 15, top side there, west at, or east at 15, heading west. 
but east winds 15 knots. Small craft advisories, Castle Cape to Sitkanak, northeast 25. Small craft advisories, Kodiak Island, north to northwest, 25 to 30 knots. And for the day on Tuesday, northeast 25 to 30 for Kodiak Island. Northeast 25, Bristol Bay, only three foot seas though. Sitkanak to Cape Sarachev, east 25, 30 knots out of the east for the uh, north side there of the peninsula. And for the uh, eastern Aleutians, 30 knots from the southeast. 8 to 10 foot seas on Alaska Island, Unmak Island, southeast 35 to 40, increasing to that in the afternoon. Adakanatka, south to southeast 40, 30 knots uh, toward Amchitka Island and back up to 45 knots in toward that low center there. Uh, could even be 50 knots early in the day, but uh, 45 with 34 foot seas. And then for Tuesday, coming down to 40 knots here for far western Aleutians, southwest 30, say from uh, Amchitka to Adakanatka and in toward the Kalski, all southwest 30 knots, and then Unalaska Island, south to southeast at 35 with 11 to 19 foot seas. For the southwest coast, east northeast at 20 tomorrow, east 30 St. Matthew Island, same thing for the Perbloff seas. Uh, for the Perbloffs at nine feet, but St. Matthew Island up to 16 feet, and then uh, east winds at 15. For St. Lawrence Island, west 15, Norton Sound. For Tuesday, east 30 knots. For St. Lawrence Island, northeast here 25 along the coast, brisk wind advisories, gale warnings for both the Perloffs and St. Matthew Island, east winds 35 knots, 15 to 18 foot seas. Eastern Boulevard Sea Coast, west winds, west southwest 15 on the east side, or for that east side, 10 knot winds, pretty light out of the west for the central coast, light northerlies on the west side, 15 to 20 knots, west northwesterlies from Wales to Cape Beaufort. And then just light variable winds at 10 here for the uh, west side of the area, 20 knot westerlies up there for the uh, eastern Boulevard Sea Coast. And for tonight, uh, next storm moves into the panhandle tomorrow. Here comes the next one across the Bering Sea. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.